Good afternoon, I'm Wes Hickman. I am uh, the university's chief communications officer and leadership is a fantastic theme for today's lunch. If all of you would look on your table, you'll see copies of this book. We call it Leading in an Era of Challenge and Change. And this is about the University of South Carolina under the leadership of Dr. Pastides since 2008. How our university has not only weathered the recession and the difficult times over the last several years, but thrived. I have had the fortunate um, opportunity to work for several what I would call outstanding leaders in my career. First, George Dean Johnson, a businessman extraordinaire in the upstate. <coughs> Second, United States Senator Lindsey Graham. And now, for President Harris Pastides. And when he interviewed me for my job, the one thing that I told him was I had an interest in coming back to South Carolina, working for a group that was going to make an impact on this state. And I think that's exactly what we've done uh, under his leadership and over the last several years. Very quickly, a couple of things that, that you might not know. Since the fall of 2009, we have increased the size of the student body at the university by 5,000 people. 5,000 more folks that are getting educated than before. We've doubled the number of applications to the university in the last 10 years. The average SAT score is up 64 points, an average of 1210 in the fall of 2014. The enrollment in our Honors College is up 65% over the last 10 years. Our retention rate is up 5% and our six-year graduation rate is up 5%. All of these are a result of Dr. Pastini's leadership, uh, the leadership of our provost and our, and our COO. And it's, it's a great and exciting time to be at the university. And I will tell you, and I, I don't think this is in his speech either, we are now educating more South Carolinians than at any point in the university's history. So that's a fantastic thing. There's a lot to be done for this state. And with that, I will introduce Dr. Harris Pastides. to my leadership, it's about our leadership. And let me uh, start right away uh, and thank uh, my brother and sister Rotarians who were close to me and to us. Uh, the events of last week were extraordinarily difficult. Uh, I'm not a broken president, but I am a challenged president. Uh, in the course of 24, 48 hours, I felt like a, a, like a cop, like a communications person, like a parent, um, like a pastor. Uh, all of those, maybe like a mayor, if I might say. That is what a college president often is, is like. And, and I see President Beth Dindorf of Columbia College. Thank you, Beth, for reaching out to me. Uh, Lieutenant Governor McMaster, always an honor to be uh, with you, of course. Um, but, uh, but today is a day of uh, fresh beginning. Uh, I tweeted something else you do as a, as a college president. I said the sun is out, the healing is advancing. You don't maybe ever heal completely. It's like a wound that will result in a scar, but from that scar you can learn something. If the scar is to a child who uh, uh, took a tumble doing something they shouldn't do, you learn from that and try not to do that again. But this particular scar came from, a, as we know now, a societal a problem that is all too common, and I know the Lieutenant Governor, when he was Attorney General, worked so hard and will continue to work uh, with uh, Attorney General Alan Wilson and the Governor and others about the scourge of domestic violence. Once the university understood that this was a case of that kind of uh, anger and, and mental health issues, uh, coupled with uh, access to a gun on the part of someone who shouldn't have had one, I think the students uh, understand today that that could have happened uh, at our university, could have happened at Columbia College, could have happened at Blue Cross, could have happened at Walmart, could have happened anywhere. It doesn't, of course, take away the great loss of a wonderful professor, uh, an extremely dedicated teacher, extremely popular and diligent and hardworking uh, and beloved. But I do thank uh, all of you for your uh, reaching out uh, to me. Uh, I hope never to have to call on that experience that is now deep, not yet deep, but will eventually uh, go deep into the well of who I am and I'll remember it. I hope never to use that uh, personally again, uh, although we become enriched as, as people and would be happy to lend that experience to others that may need it. A special thank you to Clemson University, who uh, that university in the upstate 
uh, many of whom uh, donned garnet and black on Friday, especially uh, faculty members in their public health discipline. And, and what a wonderful statement that we are. Yes, we're competitors, but we're one, and, and we are two universities, but we're one state. So thank you to them publicly. Uh, I knew today, in order to get a crowd, I needed to bring one of the many more popular figures than the president of the university. Uh, Dawn Staley is out of town, as you may know. <laughs> not, and not that he would be second to her anyway. But uh, number 21 is here, Marcus Lattimore, one of the uh, truly great human beings. You, you're going to think, I'm going to finish that with whoever played football at the university. Absolutely not one of the truly great human beings that I've ever met. And I'll tell you a little bit about that. special advisor to the president and to the athletic director. He will work hard to educate our student athletes about all the myths and legends about, you know, just come to USC and you'll be a professional uh, football or basketball player someday. I'll have a few comments, by the way, about NCAA reform, then I'll introduce Marcus to you in a few moments. But let me come back to uh, uh, being the mayor. If I, if, I, if I were the mayor, I would have uh, 50,000 students spread out across the uh, state of South Carolina. Uh, together we make a nearly five billion dollar a year impact on the economy of South Carolina. Uh, since 2008, and this is my favorite number, even, even better than number one right now in women's basketball, because that number may or may not be transient. Would you not tweet that please that I said? <laughs> but the number I love better is 59,962. That is how many baccalaureate degrees were awarded since 2008 when I became president. Nearly 60,000. And when you think about 270,000 alumni worldwide, 60,000 of them in the last six years alone. And as Wes said, the majority of those are South Carolinians. About nearly 80% of all the bachelor's degrees we award in the system are granted to South Carolinians every year. A lot is made of out-of-state students. And by the way, the two and a half times more tuition they pay on average. And I, I like that number too, by the way. <laughs> uh, but when you next time you run into somebody who's a recent college grad, a neighbor, son or daughter, you would know if they were related to you. And you don't know where they went to school. You could almost flip a coin and nearly half of them would have graduated from the University of South Carolina, either here in Columbia or elsewhere. That's a huge impact. That's by far the bigger impact than the $5 billion a year. We are also projected to need 70, South Carolina, 70,000 more baccalaureate degree earners over the next 15 years to keep up with Boeing and all of the other manufacturers and the Blue Crosses and state government and teachers and mechanics and all of the other great people. So we need to uh, educate more and we need to keep it affordable. My comments today will need to be brief. Let me talk about affordability. Uh, last week we were invited as one of the few universities in the country to testify before Congress about what we're doing to keep USC affordable. And this is what we're doing. But we're, we're, first of all, we're going to have a good conversation with state government, with, starting with House Ways and Means, the Higher Education Subcommittee, Representatives Merrill, Cobb Hunter, Gary Smith, and Philip Lowe from Florence. Many of you know them when you see them. Oh, I'll just leave it up to you. Whatever you want, whatever you want to tell them. And, and that will be a great way when we can return and restore honest conversation with state government about what is the value of a college, college degree, what is it worth, alongside with road repair and port deepening and, and, and hiring more prison wardens and all that stuff that's very, very vitally important, but also what is the value to the taxpayer of graduating 
college students in the university. But we're doing something else to keep debt down in the meantime. We are compelling students to graduate on time. It's a simple concept. But too many <coughs> students don't graduate in four years. When my daughter, who went to Emory, by the way, um, and I dropped her off uh, her first day of freshman year, the dean told me, don't expect Catherine to graduate in four years. I said, why not? It's about $35,000 a year in tuition and fees alone. That's, it's almost twice that now. And they said, and, and he told me, she'll have too good a time here. And she'll want that fifth year. I said, no way. I said, I can either take her home with me now. And I said, she wouldn't like me for that. And I said, Catherine, you're going to graduate in four years. And she did. And that's what we're trying to do now. And the way we're doing that is we're re-engineering the academic calendar. Forget college being eight semesters, four falls, and four springs. That is like your father's Oldsmobile, as they used to say. It's 120 credits. And you can get that in four years, or three and two-thirds, three and a half, three years. Don't talk about five years. And that's your challenge. How do you, how do, you do 120 credits in four years or less? Well, first of all, how about using the AP credits that you started with? Many of you know that high school students go to college when they're in high school. And I say, why did you do that? And they kind of shrug. I said, you could have been dating more. <laughs> or, you know, whatever, whatever it is you enjoy doing, but you're bringing to me young man or young lady, and the young ladies bring more credits than the young men, by the way, in case you're wondering. They play fewer video games, in case you're wondering. They bring 9, 12, 15, 18, 21 credits of college to their freshman year. And I said, that's a down payment. You ever heard of a down payment? Yeah, we know what a down payment is. You're buying a house, it costs so much. Think of a house as 120 credits. If you're bringing 15 credits, that's a down payment. It doesn't have to take you 30 years to pay off the mortgage. I said, but you need to do two things. You need to pick a major and stick with it. Oh, they don't like that. Absolutely not. They need to think about it. They need to experiment. And I say, okay, that's good. Experiment in your freshman year. But come back on August the 16th of your sophomore year with a major. If you do that, I can graduate you on time. The other thing is uh, come to school in the summer occasionally. You know, if you get a bad grade, make up that bad grade. You want to get ahead? Get, get ahead. So what we have done is negotiated with the General Assembly to provide us some uh, uh, ongoing appropriation for what we call OIT, on your time. And with that appropriation, we keep the university open in the summer and during uh, January, and also during May, a time when, and businesses love that too, because now we have students on campus. And we had 18,000 students take one or more classes last summer. The General Assembly for the first time will allow us to allow the students to use their lottery award in the summer. They're not going to get more money, no more money. You've got your allotment, you can spread it over 120 credits, but if you think you could graduate earlier on time, so now the floodgates will open. It's also a good business uh, approach for the university. We can fill our residence halls, we could sell food, we charge less to attend school in the summer because no football games. Cobra Center's not very active. Not, not, not a full university experience, but you can graduate on your time. And more and more students are raising their hands and saying, sign me up for three and a half years. Okay, so if, now if you've got the funding, mom and dad want me to spend four years here. They don't care if tuition goes up a couple of percents. I mean, I'm here for four years, then I say, great, there's nothing wrong with that model. But if uh, dad is holding up, uh, holding down two jobs and can't help you as much as he would like or mom would like, then why don't you think about graduating on your time and <coughs> save a lot of money? I'm, I'm honored that our uh, students have less average debt than the average in South Carolina. USC grads and less average debt than in the United States. So I'm delighted about that because we're, we're also, by the way, using technology. Uh, when we identify a student 
who's a freshman, and the freshmen, they are, they are irascible. They are ebullient. They are overflowing with energy. You just want them to quiet down a little bit. But they don't. But we want them to channel that energy into their academics a little bit. They're just so enthusiastic. But here's what happens. They didn't study hard enough for an exam. And now they've got, they got a D on an exam in freshman year. They quickly take the D and they kind of stuff it into their knapsack. They, they don't want to deal with it. It's just, just one D. I'll do better next time, they say. And I'm thinking, what are you going to do differently next time? I don't know. But I'm going to get an A next time. Not so easy, is it, Marcus, if you already... I'm not alleging he ever got that grade. I'm just saying. And so now... <laughs> it was Wes I was looking at. <laughs> so now, USC Student Success Central. They're located in the Thomas Cooper Library. They get a little flash. It says D on the exam, we reach out to them through technology, you know, email, text message, uh, young man or young lady, got a D, got a D in your whatever subject. Uh, you don't want to get a D for the course, do you? They write back, no, come and see us. The professors ought to be doing this and they do their best, but they've got all of the students, they've got a million things to do. So we call them in, we tell them about tutoring, about mentoring, about better study habits, about software, about <coughs> tutorials, and then we say, now you don't want to go home at the Christmas holidays and tell grandmother that you flunked out of that course. No, sir, do not. And so we're using technology to help students get and earn better grades. Just a few words about Palmetto College, which is South Carolina's only public baccalaureate degree, online baccalaureate de degree, let me back up, affordable online public baccalaureate degree completion program. I could not be more proud and grateful to the General Assembly and our other leaders who helped us with that. We've already graduated 216 students with baccalaureate degrees who took Palmetto College, the quality of USC online. There are currently 700 majors right now enrolled in the spring semester. Um, and they represent 44 of the 46 South Carolina counties. Think Marlboro, think Allendale, think Barnwell. A bright young student who got two years of college maybe at USC Salkahatchee but has no wherewithal to move to Columbia and move into one of the, you know, move into the hub. You know, they have more, no more ability to finance moving <coughs> into the hub than, than they would to buy a home in downtown Charleston. They're both equally inaccessible. And so we say, don't worry about the hub. You know, maybe your son or daughter will move into the, I don't know why I'm plugging the hub, by the way. That's just, <laughs> You know, live on campus is what I always say, but, uh, but we bring the quality of USC to them in majors where they can uh, attain jobs. And if you've never taken an online course, I would love to allow my fellow Rotarians to register for one someday or to try one. You'll love it. There's real learning that goes on with online education. You hear about all those nasty stories about the private, for-profit colleges. They do nothing wrong with respect to the quality of what they deliver. They just charge more for it than students can afford. So on your time in Palmetto College, uh, keeping student debt down, that's what plays a college president uh, in this particular day and age more than anything else. We still have the best model of higher education. Uh, I know my friend over there said we live in the best country. Uh, on, the pl on the planet, and we do that. We also have the best model of higher education. Everyone's copying it. England now, great universities. You've heard of Oxford and Cambridge. They're hiring American university presidents. They want to enrich what they, well, the classic learning that they already provide. They want more philanthropy. They want more school spirit. They want more campus life. They think they want football teams even. <laughs> Be careful about that. Uh, and, um, and so we're, we're doing all that. I, I, I don't have time now. It's, it's getting close to the end to brag about, as I'd love to. P 
Pete Bruce and the new uh, and and the new wonderful business school that we uh, put a great Leonardo Nierman sculpture in, or about the Honors College, still number one, and about the other 47 programs that are top rated by U.S. News by the great school spirit, the beauty of our campus, the new law school that we broke ground with. Thank you, Henry, again for your leadership with uh, with our law school, with. Uh, all the other great uh, refurbishments and, and residential projects that are going down. Very, very proud of all of that. Just a couple of words, though, about uh, NCAA reform because I have, to, I have to push back on the myth out there, which is that universities abuse their student athletes. Now, it is true we pay colleges too much money. Uh, you can quote me on that. Uh, they, the U.S. government says you can't. You can't conspire with other fellow university presidents to pay them less because there are laws that say you can't do that. Antitrust and uh, it, you know an infringement on, on, on competition and fair trade. Uh, it is true that we put a lot of money into new facilities. Sometimes we need them, sometimes maybe not. And it is true that in the past we were limited in sharing more of that uh, income with the players no longer. But what the outside interests, the people who represent, in certain cases, plaintiffs, in other cases, unions, and in other cases, the federal government, what, what they would have us do is take the cap off the model of, of, of collegiate athletics as we know it, and they would allow a, uh, oh, a, a beverage company or an apparel manufacturer to, pay, to take one athlete pay them egregious amounts of money to wear their clothing or drink their uh, health beverage or drive their automobile, make that one individual rich, or two or three, if they wanted that number of them, and not give one penny to any other athlete. Not any of the, not any of the other starting players or bench players or swimmers or track and field athletes or tennis players or soccer players and we're saying that's not what college sports ought to be about. So with reform, and I'll call Marcus up in a moment, we are now able to provide the full cost of attendance which is about, about $5,000 more per student athlete for things that we currently were, are not allowed to provide like what, like gas for your car, like pizza for the weekend, like date money, like laundry money, things like that. And so that $5,000 will go a long way. So right now, what does a full scholarship athlete get? They get tuition, fees, books, room and board. That's about it. They get virtually nothing else. So we're going to be able, instead of giving one player $100,000, we're going to give every student athlete up to $5,000 more uh, attenuated if they're not full scholarship, if they're part scholarship. And that will cost uh, Ray Tanner uh, nearly $2 million a year. And that's the best $2 million I think the University of South Carolina can spend. Now the reason we have $2,000, by the way, uh, I'm sorry, $2 million is that we're part of the Southeastern Conference and we've got that great network, our athletics are, are doing so well. Um, and, and the individual who epitomizes uh, the best of the modern day uh, Gamecock uh, spirit is the person who wore number 21 on his back. I've got a little uh, in, my, in my home uh, man cave, if I may call it that. I've got a little uh, table with uh, a memorabilia relative to Marcus's time uh, as a student and as an athlete at the University of South Carolina. He's, gr he's got a great message. Uh, to help me deliver. Is it okay if we invite Marcus to spend about five minutes with you? Thank you. Thank you. It's so good to be back in Columbia. <laughs> I, I want to thank everybody in this room. I didn't know too much about the Rotary Club, but learning more about it is uh, it's enlightening. And it's a way for me to connect with you guys to help student athletes. And that's what I'm all about. And when you have a leader like President Pastides who genuinely cares about the 
students at the school, there's no way you can't be successful. So thank you, President Castillo. <laughs>